Here's the last half of chapter 19, and I'm going to start out with an error that I found. This is figure 19.9, and this is not the way the blood flows through the heart. So the way they've got it going is the blood comes in over on the right side, drops down, goes over the lungs, comes back, comes into the left side, goes down, and then comes out. And, and it doesn't happen like that. Simultaneously, from the superior and inferior vena cava, the right side fills up and the left side fills up from the left and right pulmonary veins coming in. So this happens at the same time. So one and six are happening at the same time. And then it says the blood in the atrium flows down through the AV valve into the right ventricle. And at the same time, blood is flowing into the left atrium and dropping down into the left ventricle. So this is a misconception that I have seen in a number of textbooks, and they just seem to keep putting it from textbook to textbook. So anyway, it is incorrect. You do not fill up one side of the heart and then it beats and then you fill up the other side and it beats and then you fill up the other side. You fill up both sides at the same time. So this one's filling up, this one's filling up, and then when it contracts, it's kind of a ringing motion with the circular muscle and it pushes it out and the stuff that's on the left side is going to go out through the aorta and then split off. Oops, sorry about that. Here's the aorta. And split off. And the blood that's coming out of the right side is going to go out through the pulmonary artery and go off to the lungs to get oxygenated. So right side goes to the lungs. Left side goes out the aorta and to the rest of the body, up to the head and on out to the rest of the body. So this is... Um, where we start out and hopefully you guys won't get confused when you see something like this that says that this stuff happens in this particular order because it's not correct. It's important to note that not only are we sending blood from the right side to the lungs and from the left side through the aorta to the rest of the body, but about 5% of the blood that's pumped by the heart goes into coronary circulation. So in the heart itself, you've got blood vessels that are nourishing the heart itself. So you have what we call coronary circulation. In most people, or a lot of people who die, die from blockage of the coronary arteries or the coronary veins, and they don't get enough blood to nourish the muscle of the heart. And the heart muscle dies and is replaced by scar tissue, and enough, enough of it dies uh, then obviously your heart can't beat. So how do you block blood flow in the coronary circulation? Well, what usually happens is you have a fatty deposit that breaks off from some other artery and stops up one of the coronary arteries, or a blood clot gets lodged in one of the coronary arteries. Um, there are stories, if you read mystery stories, if you inject someone with a big empty syringe full of air, then it will stop the heart also. And I'm always tickled when I see uh, someone giving someone a shot and they sit there and they try to get every little air bubble out. And um, it would take a whole lot more than just a tiny air bubble to stop your heart. But you can stop the heart by giving someone a, a large bolus of air. Not that I'm recommending it, but I read a lot of books. Talking about a couple of the arteries, the right coronary artery coming off the ascending aorta supplies the right atrium and the sinuatrial node. In every other book, it's called sinoatrial node. This is the only book I've ever seen that puts a U instead of an O right there. But the SA node is extremely important because it's the pacemaker of the heart. So if you have damage to the SA node, uh, you're going to have to have a pacemaker to replace that.
So you probably heard of some people who, who are wearing pacemakers. So anyway, I find this to be interesting. Um, but anyway, and then you have branchings off of that. And the interventricular branch obviously is going to go to the ventricles. So be aware of the coronary arteries. I'm not going to ask you all of the places that all of the arteries go. Just be aware that they're important, and if you block them, you're going to have a heart attack, and you probably won't live. Before your coronary arteries get so blocked that it's life-threatening, you should probably have a coronary bypass operation. And at the last uh, time we talked, I actually showed you a video where they went in and got a, a vein from the person's leg and bypassed a blocked area of one of the coronary arteries. So that's really common to have uh, bypasses before you have a heart attack. Here's a really neat picture. You have something similar to this in your book, but you don't have it in the PowerPoint slides. So I wanted to make sure that you saw at least a picture like this. So what they've done is they've taken someone who's passed on and they've injected the veins with blue latex and let it harden, and then the arteries with red latex and let that harden. And then, of course, there's the aorta, and here's the pulmonary trunk before it splits off. Then what they've done, since the heart is mostly muscle and skin, is they put in something that dissolves proteins. And so the cells were dissolved away. And what you're left with is the latex or rubber um, insides of all of the coronary arteries and veins. So everyone has a little bit different so we think that, well, we all have two eyes and two arms and two legs and everything like that, and we're all the same. But we, we're a little bit different. And when you get down into the branchings inside of the, of the um, coronary arteries and veins, we're a little bit different. And I don't see any right here, but there are places where to bypass areas or to give extra uh, nourishment, they'll actually have an anastomosis or a joining of two vessels. So the blood has two pathways to go. So it can go the regular pathway, but then the anastomosis is like where it joins together and it can pass over and start going through a different vessel also. So that's one of the ways that the coronary um, circulation is kind of interesting in the heart. It does occur other places in the body, but we really notice it in the heart. So what do you feel when you have a blockage in some of those coronary vessels? Well, angina is chest pain from partial obstruction of the coronary blood flow. So if the blood can't get through because of a blood clot or because of hardening of the arteries or um, fatty deposits, then you're going to have downstream where the blood should have gone. As the tissue dies, you're going to have pain. If you can remember back to the first day of PE, I don't know if you did it at your school, but at my school, the gym teacher made us work out and we spent the whole PE hour doing just nonstop exercise. And the next morning you try to get out of bed and you hurt so bad you just want to cry because you've got lactic acid built up in all of your muscles. Well, the heart will try for a little while as it's dying to do anaerobic fermentation and make lactic acid. And so imagine your heart hurting like you did when you overdid it in PE class. And you'll get kind of an idea of what people go through when they have an angina attack. If you don't pay attention to the angina, then you can go on and have a myocardial infarction, or as they say, a death of part of the myocardium because you don't get oxygen to it. Uh, 
atheroma or atherosclerosis is one of the main causes. And it's where you just have fatty deposits that block off the coronary arteries. You'll also, if you're a man, feel heavy pressure or a squeezing pain radiating down into your left arm. Now, for most books, they only give the symptoms of the heart attack for a man, and they're not the same in a woman, oddly enough. Uh, they're saying silent heart attacks occur in diabetics and elderly people. So just a piece of the heart muscle dies, and the heart's just a little less able to beat, and you don't get as much blood flow, and you just get tireder because you're not having the oxygen being distributed through the body. So it is possible to have a heart attack where you don't clutch your chest and fall to the ground and do all the things that they do on the TV shows when someone has a heart attack. But no laughing matter, myocardial infarctions are responsible for about 27% of all the deaths in the United States. So it's the number one killer in the United States, not, not so much in the rest of the world. But, um, hey, we're in the United States, and that's what we care about, right? Here's one of the words that you should know. It's ischemia, and it's where you have a blockage or deficiency of blood flow. So ischemia is a blockage of blood flow. One of the things that they emphasize is if you look on the back side of the heart, the posterior view of the heart, you're going to have the coronary arteries and coronary veins dumping into what we call the coronary sinus. And so it's a widening area right here, and it's going to dump back down into the atria. Your book goes into quite a bit of detail talking about which of the blood vessels come into the coronary sinus and then dump down into the uh, right atrium. And I don't care about whether or not you want to memorize that or not. I'll not test you over it, but feel free to memorize all of this. The great cardiac, the posterior interventricular, and the left marginal veins are all going to be dumping back into the right atrium. So if you remember that the blood that's gone throughout the body comes back through the coronary arteries and the superior and inferior vena cava and dump down into the right atrium and then drop down into the right ventricle through the atrioventricular uh, flap, then I'm happy. That's what you need to know. I really love talking about analogies, and so periodically I'll do that. So humor me. Sometimes students are like, Ms. Drake, it's very disconcerting when you start talking about something that doesn't seem to apply to what we're supposed to be learning. But then other students say, oh, man, when you talk like that, I can see that happening, and so I understand something else. So for those of you who are concrete learners, sorry about that. I'm going to do an analogy here. So when you swallow food, you put food in your mouth, you chew it up, and then when you swallow it, you have this little thing that hangs down in the back of your throat. It's called a uvula. And it swings back up and keeps the food from going up and out your nose. So you kind of have to have that swinging up and closing it. And if you happen to bend over where the uvula can't swing up and close off, the, the nose, then whatever you're swallowing will come out your nose. So if you're in one of those weird moods, you want to try it out, try and swallow something while you bend over and pick something up off the floor and see if it doesn't come out your nose. So in the heart, when the ventricles are contracting, you have the, the cusp or the flaps of the valve that will cover up the opening to the coronary arteries so that you don't get blood going in and out of the coronary arteries when the heart is actually beating. 
And here's the second analogy, which as I was writing the notes and thinking, how am I going to tell them this stuff where they're going to remember it? Well, in your body, you eat all of this food, and it goes down through your stomach and then through your intestines, and then it starts building up into your rectum, which is the, the holding chamber right before your anus. And once you get the rectum with enough poop in it, and it stretches just enough, then it sends a signal, hey, it's time to have a bowel movement. So you, the coronary sinus has all these blood vessels dumping into it, and it gets fuller and fuller, and it dumps into the right atrium. So I said, think of the coronary sinus as the rectum of the heart. So in case you want to know which slide I'm talking about, it's slide number 44 as you're going through the PowerPoint. And it tells you that most coronary blood returns to the right atrium by way of the coronary sinus. All right, and now we're going to switch gears and we're going to start talking about the makeup, the structure, and how the pacemaker works, and the electrical system of the heart. So one of the things, whenever you're looking at a biopsy of someone, you've you've taken a piece of tissue out of them and you look at it under the slide, if you see more than one nucleus in a cell, then you can pretty well feel like you're looking at a cancer cell because cells don't usually have more than one nucleus. But an exception to this is the cardiac muscles and occasionally the, the other muscles in your body. So they can actually exist in a non-cancerous state with more than one nucleus, Per cell. So I thought I'd point that out because I thought that was interesting. One of the things that, that uh, is aggravating is you go through and you teach the kids, okay, here's the cell, here's all the organelles, and we have the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria, and we have the nucleus and the ribosomes, and you learn all of the parts of a cell. And then you go to another cell which would be one of the heart cells or a muscle cell, and they start renaming stuff. So if you're talking about the endoplasmic reticulum in a muscle cell, then we call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if you're reading along going, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what's the sarcoplasmic reticulum stuff? They're talking about the endoplasmic reticulum, but they've just renamed it. Now, one of the things that I've told you about and I'm going to tell you about it again, you're going to see the word intercalated disc. It's going to be on your lab test. It's going to be on your lecture test. It's what makes the heart muscle so interesting because you have gap junctions, which is like an opening. So if you've ever been in a hotel where they have two rooms and they have a, a door that adjoins both of the rooms. It's kind of like that. So you don't have to go out in the hall to go in and down and around into the next room. You just open the door and you go through. So in the case of the cardiac muscles, they have intercalated disc connecting all of the muscle cells. And sometimes they call muscle cells muscle fibers, which is a little bit confusing because there is a lot of fibrous material in the muscles. But anyway, so if you're reading along and they start talking about muscle fibers and you go, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about muscle cells. You are. You still are. They just sometimes call them muscle fibers instead, just to confuse you, I think. All right, so gap junctions allow the ions and some of the stuff in the cytoplasm to move freely from, from cell to cell. So that's kind of cool. And instead of calling them muscle cells or muscle fibers, sometimes they call them cardiomyocytes. Well, cardio means heart, myo means muscle, and the word C-Y-T-E means cell. So cardiomyocyte is a heart muscle cell. And all of the cardiomyocytes in the atria are connected but they are not connected to the ones in the ventricles. And then all the ones in the ventricles are connected. And this is important because we need the atria to contract first. 
on both the left and the right side at the same time. And then we want the ventricles to contract. So we need just a split second of pause before the message goes down to the ventricles and has them uh, contract. So we'll talk more about that in just a second. Now, cardiac muscle, if you damage it, it does not heal. The best it can do, if it doesn't kill you, is to form a fibrous scar tissue. And the fibrous scar tissue doesn't ever beat as well as that nice muscular tissue would. Another interesting fact is a fourth of each of the muscle cells, or the cardiomyocytes, is mitochondria. And that makes perfect sense because mitochondria make ATP energy. And your heart has to be, from the time you are conceived and your heart forms in your mother, all the way until you finally pass on over the rainbow bridge. Apparently, that's the nice way of saying die. Another interesting fact is that 60% of the energy used by the heart comes from fatty acids. So one of the things that we hear over and over and over again is fat is bad. Fat is not good. Don't eat fat. When actually some fats are essential, you can't live without them. Now, where we get in trouble, especially I think Americans have a real problem with this, is we eat way too much fat. So you do need fat, and the heart definitely uses fat because 60% of the energy comes from fatty acids. So we just need not to eat as much fat as we do. But you definitely do not want to cut fat out of your diet because uh, you'll have a heart attack. And I could give you the name of some people who could tell you about it. Um, the lady who was um, who sang next to me, Karen Carpenter, but she died of a heart attack because she stopped eating. So most of the people who stop eating fats can't tell you that that's not a good idea because they've passed on. 35% of the energy used by the heart comes from glucose. So almost all comes from fat and sugar. On slide 45, they summarize what I just said about uh, fibrosis, scarring, cardiomyocytes. They do say that the cardiomyocytes actually have a bunch of glycogen stored around the heart. So that's a um, storage form of sugar. If you were talking about a plant, we call it starch. But since we're not plants, we call it glycogen. And talking about the intercalated disc, it tells you a little bit more about it. And I thought this was funny. Uh, interdigitating folds. Uh, if you've never run across that word, take your hands and put your fingers together like you're going to say a prayer. And interestingly enough, you are genetically programmed to either have your thumb on top your right thumb on top or your left thumb on top. So when I put my hands together and interdigitate them, your fingers are called digits, my right one's on top. So I don't know if that's dominant or recessive, but anyway. So interdigitating folds. So the ends of the muscle cells or the muscle fibers are the cardiomyocytes, whichever you want to call them, are going to have the ends with little finger-like projections that interdigitate and help hold the cells together. Now, to hold it together, there are desmosomes. And the way I think of it, I just see Velcro. So you've got proteins sticking out, and they actually go through the membrane and hold these together. And you have, so that would be your mechanical junction. And then you have electrical junctions. So we want electricity to be able to pass through these uh, intercalated discs. And so we have the gap junctions there too. 
So the take-home message in the next slide is the entire myocardium, the muscle that makes up the heart of the atria and the ventricles act like a single unified cell. So even though it's individual cells, because of the gap junctions, um, we have the ability to cause the whole thing to act like one big cell. And so when one cell contracts, they all contract. So here's another picture of intercalated discs, just in case you have forgotten what they look like since you listened to my last lecture. And the stripes, so this is striated muscle, like your skeletal muscle, but this is under the control of the sinoatrial node, and we're going to find out that the vagus nerve is also bossing it around, uh, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then there's your nuclei right there. Here is a cartoon drawing of what we saw in the last one, and here's the interdigitating finger-like projections where the two of these things are held together. There's a little bed of collagen around the nucleus. Oh, not collagen. Sorry, glycogen around the nucleus. And your gap junctions, which will allow each of the cells to talk to each other. And remember, over a fourth of each cell is mitochondria. So they're just cranking out that ATP energy for you. This slide, I wanted to point out this part right here. If you're talking about your skeletal muscle, and we talked about when you took PE and it, you over-exercised and you hurt because you started doing exercise when you didn't have enough oxygen to continue, and so instead of going through the proper pathway and making ATP, you built up lactic acid in your muscle. The heart doesn't do that. The only time your heart will build up lactic acid is when the tissue itself is dying. So it'll try to do a little bit of anaerobic fermentation and make lactic acid to try and keep going just a little bit longer. But it's a signal that the heart is dying. You can't have the heart fatiguing like you do the muscles because you have to have your heart beat for a whole lifetime. So now we're going to talk about the electrical pathway throughout the heart. So we're going to start out, if you can see the superior vena cava as it enters the atrium, the right atrium, right at that point, you're going to have a, some modified muscle cells call the sinoatrial node, although the book puts a U there instead of an O. The sinoatrial node is the pacemaker that triggers each heartbeat. So it's hyper excitable. Now, you have other pacemaking areas in the heart, and sometimes they take over, and it's not a good thing to have happen. But it does happen from time to time. And then we have another major node once we get into the ventricles, and it's called the atrioventricular node, the AV node. So between the sinoatrial node, which is the main pacemaker, which is up in the right um, atrium, just near where the superior vena cava comes in, that's going to send out a, a depolarization event. Hopefully you learned about depolarization last semester when you talked about the muscles and the nervous system. If not, you really need to go over that, or I can give you a link to a video that will help you out with that. When we were talking about the anatomy of the heart back um, in our last conversation, I said that there's a septum that divides the right and the left side of the heart. So up at the top, dividing the right and the left atrium is the interatrial septum. 
and then you drop down, and the septum between the ventricles is called the interventricular septum. So basically, it's still it's just a septum. It's a division between the left and the right side of the heart. If you come down out of the uh, atrium and you go to the end of that septum, just as you're getting into the ventricles, there is the atrioventricular node. And this is the one that's going to send the message throughout the ventricles. Now, later on, we're going to talk about heart block. And a lot of times, this stops working, and you can't get the message from the atria to go through this node and down into the ventricles. And so we call that heart block. So we'll talk about that, and we'll see what the ECG looks like if you happen to have that happening in your, in your heart. Heaven forbid. So the AV node is the electrical gateway down into the ventricles. And once you get down into the ventricles, the, the electrical depolarization event runs through the septum and then out through the apex of the bottom and comes up the outer walls of the ventricles. So hopefully we'll have a picture in just a second and I will... I will trace it with my cursor so that you can see it. So the electrical depolarization starts with the uh, SA node, passes through the atria, comes down to the AV node, and passes down into the ventricles. And it passes through the septum of the ventricle and then off to the left and right, up the sides of the right and left ventricle. This is kind of an odd diagram showing you the electrical or the conduct, uh, electrical conductivity system of the heart. It does show you where the SA node is. So here's the superior vena cava, and here's the atrium, and there's the pacemaker, the SA node. And then the, the depolarization event occurs in both at the same time. But the only way that the information can get from the atria down to the ventricles is through the AV node right here. So in the, in the um, septum, there are fibrous uh, structures that actually keep the electricity insulated. So the only way that that energy can make it from the atria to the ventricle is through the AV node. So they've got it. And here, here's the septum over here, and then they draw the septum over here. And they do this so that you can see the valves here. So I think that's unfortunate because it makes you think that there's a septum here and a septum way over here. And this is all the same septum right there. They've just drawn it extremely oddly. And here we come down through the bundle branches. So these are um, nerves coming along here, carrying the depolarization event. They're called the bundles of his. And it's spelled like his and hers, H-I-S, but it's the bundle of his. And you can see these fibers branching out, branching out, and branching out, and we call those Purkinje fibers. So you go from the SA node through the atria, through the AV node, down the septum, the bundle branches or the bundles of his, and then you branch out to the left and the right, up through the walls of the ventricles, and those are the Purkinje fibers. So they carry the electrical impulse through the heart and cause it to beat the way that it does. I want to show you a quick video of the heart beating. Let's try that again. And it's interesting because you saw this part beating and this part beating. So let's try it one more time so you know what you're looking for. Yep, 
Here's a video of the flaps of the heart opening and closing. Here's a video of a heart of a frog beating. They've cut it open. You can see the top contracting, the bottom contracting, and the drops you see falling are adrenaline. And adrenaline is going to cause harder contractions, stronger contractions. So you're going to be able to push more blood out. If you're looking at the tracings, you can see that these are getting much larger due to the adrenaline. Everyone else in the world calls it epinephrine, but in America we call it adrenaline. You probably know that if someone has an allergic reaction, that they usually are carrying an EpiPen, and what's inside of the EpiPen is epinephrine, which we call adrenaline. And now I want to show you a, a representation of how the electrical system works. So let's see how this goes. I kind of like this one because it shows you two things at the same time. It shows you the depolarization from the SA node through the AV node down the septum. There you go, down the bundles and through the Purkinje fibers. But then over on the side, it shows you the PQRST, PQRST at the same time. So I think this is kind of a neat thing. Here are two words you absolutely have to know, systole and diastole. Systole is when the contraction occurs, and so you have the atrial contraction and you have the ventricular contraction. Diastole is relaxation, so that you have the atrial relaxation and the ventricles that relax. So usually if they just say uh, systole or diastole, they're talking about the ventricles because the atria are so much smaller and their effect is um, so little when we're watching the uh, EKG or ECG tracings. So your book is full of interesting facts and one of them is if you were to take the vagus nerve and stop stimulating the heart then the SA node would beat at 100 beats per minute. So then you stop and you think, oh, wait a minute, how do they know how the heart, the human heart would beat if you cut away the nerves that innervate it? Okay, that's a little bit spooky. So we just take that and we go, okay, I'm gonna memorize that. The SA node normally beats at 100 beats per minute, but when the vagus nerve is talking to it, then it only beats about 70 to 80 beats per minute. So there you have it. Now, I told you that there are other places in the heart that sometimes try to take over as the pacemaker, and we call those ectopic focuses or foci. And it's a region of firing other than the SA node, we do not want this to occur. This is not a good thing. You don't want to have too many bosses trying to take over the beating of the heart. So if they depolarize, they're going to try and get all the other cells that are attached to it to depolarize in spite of what the um, sinoatrial node is telling them to do. If it's bad enough, you're going to have to shock the heart. You're literally going to have to put paddles on the heart and just say, okay, everybody stop. All right, everybody start. And only the SA node's talking. Nobody listen to anything else. So you've, you've seen them use paddles on people. Well, if the 
topic focus starts talking and depolarizing and telling everybody what to do, then you're going to get a quivering of the heart called fibrillation. And if it's happening up in the um, atria, then we call it atrial fibrillation. And if it's happening in the ventricles, we call it ventric uh, ventricular fibrillation, or V-fib for short. So we'll, we'll look at what the tracings look like when that's happening. But normally, the SA node is the boss. If something happens to the SA node, the uh, AV node can take over. But the AV node is set to only beat at 40 to 50 beats per minute. And for most people, unless you're just a super athlete with an over-enlarged heart, uh, this is not enough to get enough blood for you to be able to do anything. So you'll be alive, but you'll just be sitting in your chair and you don't have the energy to do anything else. So the, you want the SA node to be the boss and not the ectopic areas that try to depolarize and you don't want the uh, AV node. But at least you have the AV node as a backup so you'll live long enough to get to the hospital and get a pacemaker to speed your heart back up. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the ions and how they cause the depolarization event to occur. The, your book goes way more into detail than I expect you to know, but I would like for you to know that when you are getting ready to depolarize the SA node, you're going to have sodium flowing into the cell. So as the sodium comes into the cell, it's going to reach a threshold. So it comes in, it comes in, it comes in. All of a sudden, it's like, okay, that's enough. I've reached the high enough potential from this sodium that I'm now going to open up the gates and allow calcium to enter. So outside of each of the muscle cells, you have calcium that's stored. And it'll be released, it'll come in, and once it starts flowing in from the outside, it will cause the depolarization to continue, and then the potassium channels open up, and potassium leaves the cell. So here we have a membrane. Sodium is leaking in. Sodium reaches a certain level. It triggers the gates to open and allow calcium to rush in. As the calcium builds up inside the cell, then you have the potassium gates opening and potassium leaves. So you have these charged particles running in and out of the cell, and that's what causes the depolarization. To give you a little bit of an analogy, when you turn your iPhone on, your iPad on, your whatever, your tablet on, you get an electrical energy that flows through. And this is kind of what you're getting in, in this particular um, case. And now you know that if you just leave your phone on and you go about your business, after a while you get this signal, hey, your um, battery's about dead. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to hook it up to an electrical source and you're going to have to recharge your battery. Well, the same thing happens in these cells. So you depolarize it, so you're using up the energy, and then you have to repolarize it. So now I've got to get the sodium back out of the cell. I've got to get the calcium back out of the cell. I've got to get the potassium back into the cell. And once I've done that, I've recharged it. I have repolarized it. And now I'm ready to depolarize it again. And so we do the same little dance of the electrons. The sodium comes in until it gets to a certain level, and then it opens up the uh, calcium gates, the voltage-gated calcium gates, and the calcium rushes in. And then once that happens, the potassium channels open up, and potassium leaves the cell, 
and then you repolarize. So you do this over and over again. So the reason that I talk about this is because there was a fad that started where they said sodium is terrible. Oh my gosh, don't eat anything with sodium. Don't salt your food. And restaurants, which used to have delicious food, suddenly started serving french fries with no salt. And they would make the beans and corn and things like that with no salt. And the flavor just became, um, well, flavorless. So I thought it was because I was getting old and my taste buds didn't work as well. But no, everybody's just leaving salt out of everything because someone somewhere said sodium was bad. Well, if you're successful in cutting sodium out of your diet and you don't eat salt, you flavor everything with uh, hot peppers or you uh, go without and just eat it tasting like cardboard, what's going to happen is you're not going to have enough sodium to keep your heart going and you're going to collapse. So one of the first things they do when somebody collapses and they take them to the hospital is they run an electrolyte panel on them. And a lot of times what happened is their sodium, their potassium, or their calcium is off. So salt-free diets, not healthy. Unless you have a condition where you cannot tolerate salt and your kidneys cannot get rid of excess sodium, then you don't want to cut salt out of your diet. If you don't get enough foods that have calcium in them, your body will start dissolving your bones because you need calcium to make your muscles work, to make your heart beat. So it will dissolve your bones. So a lot of old people have osteoporosis and they are literally dissolving their bones. So they end up with broken hips, they end up falling, um, having to have hip replacements, knee replacements, and all of that. So you've got to get enough calcium in your body or your body will just dissolve your bones because it has to get it. Now, potassium is one of the things that's really important. So whenever I'm talking to my students and they say, oh my gosh, I woke up with a Charlie horse. I had a muscle cramp so bad it woke me up and I just woke up screaming. If you don't get enough potassium, you will have Charlie horses. So if you drink a lot of caffeine, it causes you to pee out your potassium. And if your muscles can't go through this process, in comes the sodium, in comes the calcium, out goes the potassium. If you don't have the potassium to do this whole thing, you're not going to be able to repolarize and you're going to have muscle cramps. Now, potassium is so important that we discovered that if you give someone too much potassium, it'll stop this process. And so whenever you hear someone uh, uh, in the uh, going into the death chamber and they give them the um, lethal injection, what they're injecting them with is potassium. Because as soon as you get into the bloodstream and it hits the heart, the heart stops. Boom. Last semester, I hope you guys learned about the summation of muscle contractions in the skeletal muscle, and you learned about tetany so that you can maintain a um, muscle tone so you have your muscles slightly contracted at all times. Well, you don't want this to happen in the heart. You don't want summation to occur, and you definitely don't want tetany to occur. So the way that the cardiac muscle gets around that is the refractory period. So after you depolarize and then you repolarize. In the case of the skeletal muscles, you have a very short refractory period before you can 
depolarize again. But the cardiac muscle is about 250 times as long before you're able to get out of the refractory period and have another depolarization event. So your heart deliberately does not want to reach tetany. It deliberately does not want to summate or add together the muscle contractions. It wants everything to depolarize, everything to repolarize, wait, and then depolarize and repolarize again. So a long time ago, a lot of the stuff that we, we studied and a lot of the stuff that we bought, we got from Germany. And so in Germany, they spell cardiac with a K. And so all the machines were called EKG machines, electrocardiogram machines. And um, somebody finally pointed out that we're in America, and we don't spell it with a K, we spell it with a C. So you'll still hear old people like me say, oh, look at that EKG, look at the tracing, the PQRSTs. And so I'll slip from time to time and call it an EKG. But nowadays, everybody calls it an ECG, tracing. So if you hook up electrodes to the body in certain places, which hopefully you'll learn to do in lab, then you will be able to detect the electrical activity going on in the heart. And you can tell when the atria depolarize. So if you're looking at a heart tracing where the atria depolarizes, that's called a P wave. So here's your P wave right there, and that's where the atria is depolarizing. So you get this blip like that. And then you have a little bit of a pause, and then the you have the message that goes through the AV node, and now the ventricles depolarize. So that's the QRS complex. Now what you can't see underneath there is the atria repolarize. So the atria depolarize, the atria repolarize, the ventricles depolarize, the ventricles repolarize. And then that period where it's like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Okay, now the H here are going to repolarize, depolarize, excuse me, depolarize. And then they're going to repolarize. But the ventricles are depolarizing at the same time. And then you go on to the ventricles repolarizing. So this is that tracing that you see if you walk into anybody's room in the hospital. Because they, like I said, uh, almost a third of the people who die, die because their heart stops beating. So a couple of more things that they wanted us to look at. When the atria contracts... So here's a signal coming into the SA node, and then there's a contraction. Meanwhile, the signal is going down into the AV node. So this P to R interval right here is where the signal is passing from the SA node through the atrium or atria and then over to the um, SA node. So that's a PR interval. And then the QT interval is how long the ventricles remain depolarized. So here they go depolarizing, and now they're repolarizing. So they like you to know what the PR interval is and what the QT interval is. Something else that you can gather from this particular thing is when you have this ventricle uh, contracting, both the ventricles contract at the same time, you're going to be squirting blood out, and it's going to hit 
the aorta if it's coming from the left side or it's going to hit the pulmonary trunk if it's coming from the right side. This huge push of blood that happens during this time is what we call the uh, higher level or the systolic reading of our blood pressure. So if you ask anybody, they go, what's your blood pressure? You go, well, it's about 130 over 80. What they're talking about is how much pressure, how big, how inflated do your blood vessels get every time your heart beats. So the maximum pressure that's hitting your arteries and passing down into your body is should be around 125 to 135. It should not be higher than that for any period of time. Now, if you're running for a bus or something like that, you're going to have a higher blood pressure. And we, our arteries are resilient. We're going to learn about them in the next chapter. But they are stretchy. So they should be just fine if you don't continue at a high blood pressure. So if your blood pressure is like 180, that's way too much. You are just pounding your, your arteries, and eventually they're going to weaken and they're going to pop. So you've got to get your blood pressure down. You can't, you can't survive with a blood pressure of 180 or 200 for very long. Now, when the blood has passed through and the heart's not beating, and you remember you have a refractory period where the heart's not beating, not beating, not beating. That is after the blood has passed through and the arteries have gone back down to as small as they can be. So they'll never collapse completely because they've always got blood running through them. But this is the least amount of pressure that's running through your blood vessels. So we, we call that the the diastolic reading. So you have a systolic reading and a diastolic reading. And you want the diastolic reading to be around 75 to 85, somewhere in that region. So they keep moving it around a little bit. And then it varies if you're old, if you're young, if you're a woman, if you're a man. So, but in general, 125 over 75, 135 over 85, you're in the right range. Life is good. Here are some of the things that can cause your EKG or your ECG tracing to not look like that nice P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, like what you want it to look like. So if you had a myocardial infarction, if a piece of your heart has actually died, it's going to change the way that tracing looks. If you have something that's blocking your conduction pathway, your SA node isn't working correctly, your AV node isn't working correctly, you have the, the bundles that come down the septum for some reason are blocked, and you can't get the, the signal to go down through the septum and then come back up through the Purkinje fibers, you're going to see an unusual ECG tracing. If your heart is enlarged, so sometimes your heart isn't pumping correctly out of either the left side or out of the right side. And in compensation for that, your heart will enlarge. It'll, you'll actually grow more heart muscle tissue. And so uh, this is going to change the way your ECG tracing looks. If there's something wrong with your electrolytes, so we talked about the sodium and the calcium and the potassium, if those are off, you can see it in the ECG reading. And if you have a hormone problem, so one of the most famous of the hormones that's going to mess up your, your heart is your thyroid hormone. So if you have too much thyroid hormone, you're going to have a racing heart, and you can actually have a heart attack. So one of the things that people found out a long time ago is that the thyroid hormone speeds up your metabolism. Well, people are always looking for ways to get their metabolism faster so they can eat more food without gaining weight. 
So people always talk about, oh, yeah, I have a really fast metabolism, so I can eat anything I want. And people are like, oh, man, I wonder if I can get my doctor to give me some thyroid hormone, and it'll speed up my uh, metabolism. Well, if you're not built for it and you're taking too much thyroid hormone, it can actually cause you to have a heart attack. So that's not a very smart way of losing weight. Probably just cutting down on the food that you eat is the best way to lose weight. So um, hormone imbalances, another way that you can mess up your heart rate. So arrhythmia means, A means no or not. So you don't have the proper rhythm, arrhythmia. So here is a normal P Q R S T P Q R S T. Here's what happens if the ventricles are not under the control of the AV node. It looks just like a kid trying to draw something. There's just no rhyme or reason to it. You're not seeing these nice defined uh, strokes that you should be finding. So that's what V-fib looks like. And if you're in V-fib, they're going to have to use the paddles on you and get your heart to stop doing that and start beating correctly. So V-fib has to be electrically shocked to get that to working correctly. So you have a slide that tells you what happens in V-fib, and it's the hallmark of a heart attack, also known as a myocardial infarction. It will kill you quickly if you don't get out of V-fib very fast. So that's where they use those paddles and try to reset your heart, and that won't cure whatever caused you to go into V-fib but if they can get the heart started long enough, they may be able to fix other things. So allow time for other corrective action. All right, here's some more tracings. You should be learning these in your lab also. But I want to make sure that I go over them with you in this class so you get a double dose of it. So atrial fibrillation. Okay, you're not seeing the QRS complex. Because if the atria isn't doing its job, it can't send the message down to the ventricles and allow them to do their job correctly. Okay, heart block. Here you go, normal, do, 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 normal. Oh, wait a minute. Where's the QRS? Where's the QRS? You're missing those. So here's the atria doing its thing correctly, but not sending the message down to the ventricles. So that's what heart block looks like. And PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, almost everybody has these. So it, but it feels funny when you, they call it throwing a PVC. So your heart beats incorrectly. And what will happen when it happens to you is it'll make you cough. And I, I call it a barking cough. So when it happens, you'll go, <coughs> kind of like that, just one cough. <coughs> but when you do that, you push your diaphragm. And when you push your diaphragm, remember your heart's sitting on your diaphragm, and it'll actually kind of push the heart. And it's like, uh-uh, don't do that. So it was interesting talking to the people who had PVCs, and they're all like, yeah, do you guys do that funny little cough thing? And they're all like, yeah, I thought I was the only one who did it. Let me back up and make sure that I said the atrial fibrillation correctly, uh, because I was trying to play that back in my head, and I was like, did I say that right? So AFib is where the atria is not contracting correctly. I think I said that right. So there's no P wave. But you do have a QRS, but not a very good one. And then you have the uh, T wave. But then you don't have the P wave again because the P wave is the atria depolarizing. So obviously this is not what you want, but at least if you get the ventricles to contract, you'll not die. But you really need to get this fixed. In V-fib, you die if they don't fix it. 
All right, going back to the PVCs we were talking about, what could cause it to happen? So we talked about ectopic focuses, places within the heart that try to take over and tell the whole heart to beat. So you have some in the ventricular region. That's why they call them ventricular. And they cause you to have an extra beat. So instead of waiting for the depolarization and the repolarization of the atria and the message to go from the SA node through the atria down through the um, AV node and then into the septum, a piece of the uh, ventricle just says, okay, we're going to beat right now. And so you just have this extra beat. And what can cause it if you're really stressed? It causes your heart to beat funny if you don't have enough sleep or if you're taking stimulants. I remember one time where I was really worried about a test and I drank five cups of coffee and washed it down with a no-dose. That's way too much caffeine. And so it was a wonder that I was even able to take the test because my hands were shaking and my heart was beating funny. So watch out with the stimulants that you take. So there's drugs you can take that are stimulants, like speed, but then there's also things like drinking coffee or smoking a whole lot of cigarettes and getting the nicotine. So we were talking about your blood pressure, and we said 125 was a pretty good systolic, and uh, 75, 80 is a pretty good diastolic. If you're not an athlete, you're not old, you're not ill, whatever. How do, I mean, what do those numbers mean? Well, back in the day, they would measure pressure by pushing mercury up a tube. So if you looked at the old sphygmomanometers, that's, that's a fun word to say. Sphyg, it's like you're trying to say fig, but you put a s on it. Sphygmomanometer. That's the blood pressure cuff that you use. So what you're doing is you're actually pumping it up. So nowadays we have little dials that the little hand moves around the dial. Or you have digital where you just put it on and it inflates for you and then the little numbers flash up and tell you what your blood pressure is. But back in the olden times, they actually had to put pressure and then they would watch the mercury as it moved up and down this tube. And they had it calibrated, so they knew if the mer mercury worked up to here, then the barometric pressure was this, or the arterial pressure was this, or whatever pressure it was that they wanted to be measuring. So, But right now, we just use a blood pressure cuff, and we pump it up. So you have to put the blood pressure cuff on correctly. And uh, hopefully, they're teaching you that in lab. But you always want the little cable that hooks up the machine to the cuff, the little thing that you press, you want that lined up over the radial artery. So I always tell everybody, just line it up from your thumb. Come up your thumb and go up above your elbow, and that's where you want to line that cuff up where the tube comes out as if it were going to run down to your thumb. So hopefully your, your lab instructor will tell you that or whatever online lab that you're taking. Another thing that can happen to the heart is if your valves, remember they're held down by heart strings, the ones that are between the atria and the ventricles, so that they don't, when the contraction occurs and you squeeze the ventricles really hard, you don't want those flaps of the valve to flip inside out like an umbrella flipping inside out when the wind hits it. If it does, if there's something wrong with the heart strings or the, um, the muscle, the papilla that's down there that's holding those heart strings, then the valve can bulge up into the atrium, and we call that a prolapse. Now, most people think about a prolapse as something falling out of the proper place. And one of the main things that whenever I'm talking about prolapses uh, would be the uterus. Some women, the suspensory ligaments that hold the uterus up are so stretched from having children or from losing weight that 
It actually allows the uterus to slide down the vagina, sometimes even out of the body. So if you really want to gross yourself out, just go and Google prolapsed uterus, and you can see where uterus is falling out of cows and horses and people. It's, it's, uh, so prolapse, most people think it means falling down, but it just means something that's out of place. So a, a prolapse of the valves means that they flip inside out, and so they're not doing their job correctly because they're supposed to be held down by the heartstrings, the corda tendinae, and not allowed to flip up like that. So I went ahead and just threw in the word ptosis. It, you, the P is silent. So it's ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S. That's the word for drooping downward. So usually you use the word for ptosis. Like some people can't raise their eyelids high enough. So it always looks like they're kind of squinting at you. And they have surgery that will just pull your eyelids right on up. And they are happy to do it if you want to go to the doctor and pay for that. Uh, so ptosis of the eyelid. Another ptosis is where your kidney is sitting in a pocket of fat. And if you lose that pocket of fat, you lose weight really fast. Sometimes your kidneys drop down and it puts a kink in the tubes that lead out of the kidneys or the tubes that lead out of the bladder. And so you actually get a kink kind of like a kink in the water hose, and so you don't pee right. So ptosis of a kidney is dangerous. Ptosis of your eyelids just kind of embarrassing, and it would be a cosmetic surgery to lift that up. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about, auscultation. Auscultation, A-U-S-C-U-L-T-A-T-I-O-N, is where you're just listening to body sounds. So since we're in the chapter on the heart, we're going to talk about when they listen to your heart sounds. And when you listen, it kind of goes lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. So you can actually hear that. And if you listen very carefully, if there is a hole in the septum, you can actually hear the blood squirt through the hole. Or if the flaps don't seal correctly and some of the blood squirts back through any of the valves, then you're going to hear, you're, you literally can hear the blood squirting back through. So they usually call those murmurs, heart murmurs. So you have the lub dub, but then sometimes you have this little squirting sound. Or if the uh, valve that uh, comes out of the left ventricle and comes up through the aorta, if that aortic valve is not correctly uh, sealing, then they say it actually sounds squeaky, like you're rubbing your wet finger on a balloon and you get a squeaking noise. So uh, listening, learning to listen to the heart is something that is kind of an interesting art that uh, doctors and nurses need to learn how to do. There's another error I found in your book. Uh, I think it's on page 712, if I remember right. And it says that the heart ejects 70 milliliters of blood from each of the two ventricles. And it's not true. The total amount that the normal heart ejects when you add both sides together is 70 milliliters not 140, not 70 from the left and 70 from the right. So uh, it's, it's uh, confusing when you're, when you're reading it in the book. So the question that they have then is, how many heartbeats would it take to run all the blood in your body through the heart, over to the lungs, and then back over to the heart? And it's about a minute. So it takes about 28 beats to move two liters. Most people have anywhere from four to six liters. It depends on if you're a woman or a man and if you're big or you're small. So somewhere in that vicinity. 
So I just threw a little question there. If you get rid of 70 milliliters per bead and you cut a major artery, so if you watch any of these TV shows, they're always cutting the, the artery in the neck or they cut the femoral artery in the leg or um, anyway, so the person is bleeding out and they're laying there and you, they were like, can you tell us who did it or can you tell us where the body is buried or, you know, they always want to ask all these questions while the person's bleeding out. So I was just thinking, how long would it take? Or let's say a man who has six liters of blood. How long would it take at 70 milliliters per beat? How many beats of his heart would he have before he exsanguinated? So the word exsanguinate means to drain your blood. Or in this case, bleed to death. So I just thought that would be an interesting mathematical thing that you might want to do. All right, a long time ago... They talked about dropsy. So you, know, you hear old people talk about dropsy, but you don't hear uh, contemporary people use that term very much. If for some reason your left ventricle is pumping more blood than the right, then what you're going to end up with is high blood pressure, which is called hypertension, and edema. So if you press the blood out so hard throughout the body and it's not able to come back to the right side and go over to the lungs and then return to the circulatory system, the fluid will be pressed out of your um, capillaries and into your tissues. So you're going to have swollen legs, you're going to have swollen fingers. So edema is fluid that has leaked out of your circulatory system and is filling up your tissues. So people who have edema are told to be sure and raise their uh, legs. So they're, they're supposed to sleep with their legs elevated so that the blood, the, the fluid will return to the heart uh, with a little bit of gravity helping because the heart isn't doing it correctly. So there's a, a figure 19.21 I want you to look at. Before I go to 19.21 uh, figure and talk about it, I, here's a slide that I want to make sure that I cover. This is slide number 81. There are problems with the heart that are caused by the valve not working correctly. So we talked about the heart murmur. So that would be an abnormal heart sound by the regurgitation or the squirting of blood through an incompetent valve. So what can make a valve incompetent? What can make the flaps or the cusps or the valves not work correctly? Well, one of them is if you have scar tissue. So the cusps are stiff because scar tissue doesn't give way very well, which is a good thing. I mean, we want scar tissue to heal up areas that are damaged, but they, it's not elastic. So that's going to be one of the problems that you have. Some people are actually born missing one of the flaps. So they can go in and just sew you a new flap in. Now, if you have rheumatic fever, so one of the things... That right now, of course, everybody's freaked out about COVID, but when, when there's non-COVID times about, then one of the things they freak out about is strep throat. And um, I'm sure a lot of you've had it. Your throat really, really hurts, and when they look in your throat, your tonsils are just white. They're, they're, they're um, uh, fuzzy almost. And inside the the tonsils and on the outside of the tonsils you've got a uh, streptococcus growing so that's why they call it strep throat because it's kind of a bacterial infection nowadays we have antibiotics and we can treat strep throat but in the olden days back before we had antibiotics or people didn't take the antibiotics correctly the um strep could actually cause, while you're trying to heal your body of the strep and you're trying to kill the bacteria, you will actually confuse your heart 
with the strip. So apparently there's some part of the bacteria that looks a little bit like some part of your heart. So while you're killing the bacteria, you're also killing your heart. And we call that rheumatic fever. And so it is a, a byproduct of uh, getting strep throat. So that's why you don't want to mess around with strep throat. Strep itself is not life-threatening, but if you allow it to continue, it can cause damage to your heart that's permanent. So autoimmune attack of the mitral and the aortic valves. This is, this is not a good thing. Another thing that they, they, I remember when they talked about it, and I thought, well, that's the silliest thing I ever heard is people who, who either don't brush their teeth correctly or they end up getting some sort of an infection around their teeth. It said it was causing heart problems. And I'm thinking, well, now how in the world will you not brushing your teeth, will it cause your heart to have heart problems? But it is a true story. And the bacteria that can get into the gums and cause gingivitis and all of that can actually go in and start growing around the heart. So it's important to have good oral hygiene to protect your heart. Just as something that you do need to know, one out of 40 people has a mitral valve prolapse, meaning that when the ventricle contracts, it blows the flap, one of the flaps, up into the atria. So if it's bad enough, it can cause chest pain and shortness of breath. So one out of 40 people have it. So it's, it's definitely not uncommon. It is very common to have this. Another interesting thing is that we're familiar with the lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. But if you're listening to a child, you'll often hear three sounds, not two. But as you get older, you lose that third sound. So by the time you're 30, you don't hear it. It's very rarely heard in people over the age of 30. But it's very common in children. The other thing is, I... I warn students because I know that a lot of you are going into nursing and they have a really sneaky question that they used to ask. I don't know if they still do. But one of the things, they ask if a person has a heart rate over 100. Say a person has a heart rate of 130. Is this, is this a bad thing? Is, is this person in danger? And almost everybody immediately thinks, well, yes, your heart rate should be under 100. And 130 is what you'd get to if you were exercising really hard or something. So, yeah, 130 is not normal. Well, it's a trick question because little children's hearts beat at 120 to 130 beats. So you would have to say, it depends on the age of the individual whether or not 130 is an abnormal heart rate. So anyway, I just thought that was a sneaky little question because most people are thinking, oh, you mean like grown-ups. You're not thinking about little babies. Here's a Wiggers diagram. And it puts together so many of the things that we've been talking about all in one table. So let me point out a few things that I want you to know. I want you to know what the ECG tracing is, the P, QRS, and T. I want you to know what's occurring for P, QRS, and T, because you'll have to know that for lecture and for lab. Now, here is showing the ventricular volume, the filling, and then here's the contraction, so your volume drops off to almost nothing because you've squeezed it all out, and then now you're filling back up again. So they're showing the filling of the heart. Uh, they're, they're showing you the diastole and the systole, when the valves, which valve is opening and stuff like that. 
And they're showing you the heart sounds, the lub dub, lub dub. And if you have a third one where it fits in during the um, uh, refractory period, if you have a little kid. So you, there you go, lub dub, that sound, lub dub, that sound, the third one. And down here they're showing you the heart. Here's where this is filling up. Here's where this is squeezing. Here's where it's coming out. So they're showing you the phases there. So this is called the Wiggers diagram, and, and I just thought I would point it out. But the thing I really want you to know is the ECG tracing. That's, of all of this, that's the one I, I really uh, insist on you knowing. This is the slide that I was looking for, 19.21. Uh, so we talked about what happens if the ventricle is pushing more fluid than the right side, or excuse me, the left ventricle is pushing more than the right side ventricle. And in that case, you have dropsy, you have high blood pressure and edema. If you have the right side pushing more fluid, then what you're going to do is you're actually going to get a fluid accumulation around the lungs. So this is no good. You, your lungs need to not have a lot of fluid around them because it will impair the, your ability to inhale and exhale. So fluid accumulates in the pulmonary tissue if you have too much uh, from the right ventricular side. So we call it pulmonary edema. So if they talk about pulmonary edema, now you know what's causing it. But on the left side, if the left ventricle is pushing too much, then you get high blood pressure outside in the body, not just at the lungs. All right, a couple more facts that you need to know. Uh, tachycardia means your heart is racing, it's beating too fast. In a normal person who is not a baby, 100 beats per minute, anything above that is considered tachycardia. Bradycardia is your heartbeat, your heart rate is too slow, and it's less than 60 beats per minute. But now that's not true for athletes. Athletes have developed such uh, an enlarged heart and such good muscle tone in the heart that they don't have to beat as often in order to get enough blood to go through their body. So their hearts are larger and they beat more efficiently. So they don't have to beat at 60 beats per minute. So they may be down at 40 beats per minute. But for regular people, anything under 60 is considered bradycardia. Now, one of the things that your book said that I did not know, so I've got to try this if ever my heart is racing, but if your heart is beating too fast, if you put cold water on your face, it will drop your heart rate. So I know that I've seen in movies, if somebody's having hysterics and you know acting crazy, they'll throw a glass of water in their face to, to kind of stop them. But I didn't realize that that was actually a thing until I was looking at this particular textbook. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Now, they go into the brain and they go into the medulla oblongata and talk about how it controls the heart. Now, we know that the heart beating is controlled by the sinoatrial node and the uh, AV node. But you can send signals by way of hormones or by way of literally electrical signals into the heart. And you can tell the heart to go faster or tell the heart to go slower. Or you can tell the heart to have a stronger contraction so that you empty more out than you normally would. So they talk about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So I'm hoping that you remember that from your chapter on nerves. Whenever I want to remember about sympathetic, I think about bears. And I think about being chased by a bear. So when you are chased by a bear, you have the flight or fight. You have a surge of adrenaline, which is 
properly called epinephrine. So you have this surge of epinephrine, and it will cause your heart to accelerate. So your sympathetic is going to cause your heart to speed up. And that'll help you because now you've got more blood circulating, more oxygen. Your muscles are going to work more efficiently, and you can run from the bear. Or in the case of your heart, you can pump more blood. The parasympathetic is under the control of the left and right vagus nerves. And remember, we talked about if the SA node was left alone, it would beat normally 100 beats per minute. But because the vagus nerve is stimulating the heart, it holds the heart rate down to about 70 or 80 on average. So the parasympathetic is inhibitory. It slows the heart rate down. So you have sympathetic and parasympathetic. So like I said, when you think of sympathetic, think of the bear, your heart races, your mouth goes dry, the blood rushes out of your face and rushes into your uh, arms and legs so that you can fight or, or run, whatever you need to do. All right, another thing you need to know is about your cardiac output. And this is math, but don't shut down on me. Math is okay. The math is pretty easy here. The output of your heart the CO, cardiac output, is simply how many times your heart beats per second, or excuse me, per minute. So it's your heart rate times your stroke volume. How much do you squirt out every time you contract your ventricles? So cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. And they measure the stroke volume in milliliters per beat. And remember, it's 70, not 140. So CO equal HR times SV is the formula, if you ever see it. And that's pretty, I mean, it makes sense. If you squirt out 70 milliliters every time your heart beats, and your heart beats 100 times, then you're beating out 700 milliliters. So the math is pretty easy. Just multiply the two numbers together, and that's how much blood is coming out of your heart. If you are going to take somebody's pulse, the two places that they recommend, take your first two fingers, not your thumb. A lot of people want to use their thumb. And come up from the person's thumb and push down right above their thumb on their wrist. And that's where your radial artery is. And that's a really good place to test somebody's heart rate. So you put your fingers there. And you can count for a whole minute to find out how many beats there are per minute. Or you can count for 15 seconds and multiply by 4 if you get bored easily. The other place you can do is the common carotid artery in your neck. But most people would rather have you put your fingers on their wrist rather than fumbling up around on their neck. There are hormones, there are neurotransmitters, and they can speed up the heart, they can slow it down. If you allow the heart to go as fast as it possibly can, so you use drugs or you use um, uh, neurotransmitters, the fastest the heart can beat is 230 times a minute. But of course, if you try to beat 230 times a minute, you're going to get so little volume coming out because you don't have time for the heart to fill back up again. So you're, you're not squirting enough blood through the body and your cardiac output will be uh, decreased, which sounds kind of odd. You'd think at 230 beats per minute, you'd have a lot of blood flow. But your, your heart just can't, um, can't take care of that much uh, blood coming in and out that fast. If you had too much vagal stimulation, so we've already talked about vagal stimulation inhibits, and it holds your heartbeat down to around 70 or 80 instead of the 100 that the SA node wants to do, 
you can actually have vagal stimulation to lower your blood pressure down to 20 beats per minute or even you can stop your heart. So vagal stimulation is really important. One of the things a lot of people do when they get old is they stand up too quickly and the blood rushes out of their head and they pass out. So in the next chapter, we're going to talk about why old people should not stand up quickly so that they don't pass out or fall down. I notice now when you go to the doctor, that's one of the things you walk in, they go, well, have you fallen in the last month? I'm like, no. Thank you for asking, though. All right. And there's a table. Let's see if we can find the table. Look over this, and a lot of this you already know, so you shouldn't have too much problem with it. But if you have sympathetic nervous problem uh, stimulation, then it'll increase your heart rate. If you take too much thyroid hormone or you make too much, high, too much thyroid hormone, it will increase your heart rate. If you drink caffeine, if you smoke cigarettes, if you don't get enough calcium in your body, you'll increase your heart rate. To reduce your heart rate, you do parasympathetic things, not sympathetic, parasympathetic things. Acetylcholine is one of the neurotransmitters that will calm your heart rate down. If you have too much calcium, if you have too much calcium, it will cause your heart to beat more slowly. And if you do not have enough potassium. So everyone else in the world calls potassium calcium, but we call it potassium. So hypo, not enough potassium, will slow your heart rate down. And then if you take medicine, so they have all these different medicines you can take for high blood pressure, and one of them is a beta blocker. And if you take a beta blocker, it will also slow your heart rate down. So it should lower your blood pressure. Now, for your stroke volume, how much blood you push out every time the ventricles squeeze, not enough calcium will cause you to have less blood flowing through and too much potassium will lower your stroke volume. Increased stroke volume, anything sympathetic, adrenaline, which is epinephrine, uh, too much sugar stored in the form of glucagon. The medicine called digitalis can increase your stroke volume and um, nicotine and caffeine. So we just said, wait a minute, here it is up here with increased heart rate. So it'll not only speed up your heart rate, it will also cause you to push out more of your blood. And hypercalcemia will do the same thing. So look at these things. And if you have high blood pressure, it's like, oh, is there something wrong with your hor uh, thyroid hormone? Maybe go get that checked. Are you drinking too much caffeine? All right, a few more facts and then we're done. There is the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. And I remember having to learn it and thinking, well, duh, when I heard it. Your stroke volume is proportional to the end diastolic volume. That's just a fancy way of saying that if you put more blood in the ventricle, so you're going to push out more blood. I thought, some guy got to name that after himself? Are you kidding me? So if you fill the end diastolic volume, if you fill the ventricles with more blood, you'll have a larger stroke volume when you squeeze it out. So there you go, the Frank Starling Law. Because the lungs and the heart are so intimately connected and all of the blood coming from the right side goes over to the lungs, if your lungs are messed up, then you're going to have a problem. Like emphysema, 
In this case, the, the lung tissue is dying because you've smoked usually. It's one of the main causes of emphysema. If you have chronic bronchitis where you just constantly have an infection in your uh, the bronchial tubes going down to your lungs, if you've worked in the coal mines and you've breathed in so much coal dust that it's literally filled your lungs up with, with black coal to where you can't exchange oxygen, any of these things where you can't exchange oxygen out of the lungs can cause right ventricular failure. So this is, this is part of why people who have black lung die and people who have emphysema die. It's rare for somebody to die of bronchitis because if you get that sick, hopefully they'll give you antibiotics and clear it up. Now I'm going to talk about two words that sound a lot alike, atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis, because they both end in sclerosis and they both start with A. But atherosclerosis is where you have lipid depositing or fat depositing on the walls of your artery, and it slowly but surely fills in the artery to where blood can't go through. It's like getting a hair clog in your sink where you can't get the water to go down the drain. It's kind of the same sort of idea, except for it's caused by fatty deposits. So that would be atherosclerosis. But arteriosclerosis is after you've gotten this fatty deposit on the arterial wall, sometimes your body goes through and puts like a calcium crust over it. And at that point, we call it arteriosclerosis. Uh, old people will call it hardening of the arteries. And interestingly enough, my grandmother, after surviving cancer and all sorts of other things, she finally died. And when they down her birth or her death certificate, they put that she had uh, hardening of the arteries. So they used the old-timey version of uh, arteriosclerosis on her death certificate. So I thought that that was kind of interesting when I was doing the genealogy. The reason we worry about atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis is one, you don't get enough blood through the, the artery or the blood vessel where you, you're developing these plaques. They're called plaques, P-L-A-Q-U-E-S. And they can break off. A chunk of the fat can break off or a chunk of the calcium a hardened plaque can break off. And they can, if they go to the brain, they can cause a stroke. If they go to the lungs, they can cause a pulmonary embolism. And if they go to the heart, they can cause you to have a heart attack. So anytime you have uh, wads of fat or uh, thick calcium deposits on the wall of your blood vessels, you're at higher danger of a stroke uh, or a heart attack. Now, if you're worried about too much cholesterol, first of all, don't eat too much cholesterol. But you need cholesterol because it builds your body and it's a healthy thing. But if you get too much of it, they fear that it can uh, deposit in your blood vessels. So if you will eat fiber, things like uh, beans, shredded wheat, um, you can buy fiber, mix it in a glass and drink it. But Fiber actually causes the fats in your body to adhere to it, and then it passes out in your feces instead of you absorbing it into your body. So uh, fiber is one of the things that will help you lose weight, oddly enough. If you do have atherosclerosis, where you you're have this fatty deposit and the lumen is filling in, they can go in with uh, and do what they call balloon angioplasty. So they just thread a wire with a little balloon on the end of it until they get to the place where the blood is constricted and it can't pass through the vessel very well. And they can literally gently inflate the balloon and push the fat back up and open the lumen up. It usually doesn't last very long, but at least for a while it fixes it. So if you wanted a more permanent fix, you would just do a bypass around where the, the plaque is. But the balloon angioplasty is, is much less uh, invasive than going in and actually doing open heart surgery. 
And the last word that I want to talk about is a stent. And you can install a stent and it will hold open the uh, artery. So if you've never seen a stent, this is what it looks like. It's a tube with this meshwork and they have to thread it in to the place where you have the uh, occlusion, where you have the problem, where you have the plaque, where you have the buildup.